Good evening. I'm Beth Keller from Highland Park Public Library. We'd like to welcome you to this special event, an evening with Andrea Elliott, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Invisible Child, Poverty, Survival and Hope in an American City. Andrea will be joined in conversation this evening with Steve Edwards. Tonight's special program is presented by a partnership of 21 public libraries across the state of Illinois. Joining me today are Grace Hayek from Glencoe Public Library and Christy Palangato from Naperville Public Library. Tonight, Andrea and Steve will be discussing Andrea's book, Invisible Child, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize last month. We're honored to bring this program to so many different communities. The New York Times, The Atlantic, and Time named Invisible Child one of the top 10 books of 2021, a future American classic, a vivid and devastating story of American inequality, and a rare and a powerful work whose stories will live inside you long after you've read them are just some of the quotes about the book. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded. As an attendee tonight, your microphone and camera are turned off. Closed captioning has been enabled. You can turn on or off the closed captioning by clicking on the live transcription or the more icon at the bottom of your screen. Following tonight's event, there'll be a question and answer session. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the event tonight. My colleague, Christy, will moderate the question and answer session. Thanks to the Bookstall and Prairie Fox Books for supporting this event with online sales of Andrea's book, Invisible Child. You can find links to purchase the book in the chat box. I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Grace Hayek from Glencoe Public Library to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Andrea Elliott is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who's documented the lives of poor Americans, Muslim immigrants, and other people on the margins of power. She's an investigative reporter for the New York Times and the author of Invis Invisible Child, which won the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction and was chosen by Barack Obama as a favorite book of, of the year and by the New York Times as one of the top 10 books of 2021. She's also a recipient of a 20, 2007 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing, a George Polk Award, the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, an Overseas Press Club Award, and Columbia University's Medal for Excellence, given to one alumna under the age of 45. Ms. Elliott is the first woman to win individual Pulitzer Prizes in both journalism and arts and letters. She'll be joined in conversation by Steve Edwards, who spent more than 20 years as an award-winning journalist, interviewer, and host of such acclaimed programs as WBEZ's 848 and The Afternoon Shift. As a journalist, his work has appeared on the BBC, Bloomberg News, PBS, and numerous public radio stations around the United States. Most recently, he was Chief Content Officer and Interim CEO of WBEZ Chicago Public Media, Chicago's NPR news, news station. From 2012 to 2017, Edwards helped launch and lead the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, a nonpartisan program devoted to cultivating the next generation of public service leaders. He's currently a managing director at Poya Partners, an executive search and strategic advisory firm focused on identifying and strengthening mission-driven leaders across the civic and nonprofit sectors. Welcome, Ms. Elliott and Mr. Edwards. We're so glad that you can do this for with us tonight. Please begin. Grace, thank you so much for that introduction and for the opportunity to be in conversation with all of you tonight. And Andrea, thank you so much for your book, uh, for this astonishing reporting and for um, the conversation we're about to have. It's great to be in conversation with you. I'm so thrilled to be here tonight with all of you. And it's especially meaningful to me that this is um, a library centric event because libraries are, uh, are so, so vital in the lives of, of poor children in America and all children really, so thank you. We, I should point out just to reiterate something that, that Beth said at the outset, we very much want to involve you in the conversation. So um, I'll begin by talking with Andrea a bit and then uh, all of you who are with us tonight, um, as we go forward uh, in a bit, I will 
encourage you to chime in with your questions and Christy Palangati will uh, make sure that we get your questions into Andrea as we go forward. But let me start with you, Andrea, if you don't mind, and sort of connect this work to what Grace had mentioned at the beginning, which was prior to really October of 2012, you were working as an investigative reporter for the Times, doing long form enterprising work. You're also doing a lot of work uh, at really examining Islam in the United States following uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. What was it in the fall of 2012 that had you turning your attention to the questions of poverty, inequality, and homelessness? Well, for one thing, I have always been um, comfortable being uncomfortable as a reporter, being an outsider, coming into other worlds, worlds that are not my own. Uh, and I think after seven years, it was that I had been immersed in looking at different aspects of life, of Muslim life in a post 9-11 West. I felt ready for a new subject. Um, and so that opened me up to just starting to think about things right as Occupy Wall Street occurred. And this new awakening was happening in America about inequality. And that made me feel like really looking at it myself just more closely, which led me to pull a book off of my childhood home shelf. I was visiting home. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and I was in the same bedroom that I spent my high school years in, and there was a book I had last read in high school called There Are No Children Here by Alex Kollowitz, about two brothers in the um, Chicago public housing projects. And as I began to reread that book, I kept asking myself, how much has really changed? Because it had been more than 20 years. And that question, and it's always just quite a big question like that, a very basic question. I always think as a reporter, there is no such thing as bad question. You know, I, I'm a, what I am as a professional question asker. <laughs> I just ask a lot of questions and I'm constantly turning them around in my head. And they're, some of them are very basic. <laughs> it's like, well, like, how much has changed? It's just a very basic question led me to do a little research and see that the child poverty rate in the United States in 2012 was the exact same one in five kids growing up poor as it had been when I first read that book in the early 90s. So that the, the, the needle had barely moved. It had moved over the years as poverty tends to reflect the economy and other forces, right? So it had gone up and gone down, but basically we were still in that one in five place. And so that's that's what led me into this, into this new terrain. Yeah. So Sometime thereafter, you find yourself, um, and you talked with an editor about how to find your way into this story. And one of the things, if I have the story correct, was that you, you felt it'd be important to identify a family, particularly tell this story through the eyes of, of children. So tell us about how you came to meet um, Dasani's family and Dasani Coates herself, um, who's really at the center of this remarkable narrative that you tell. So I had this checklist um, in my mind of what I was looking for that was based on a lot of preliminary interviews with experts. And that checklist was a very different portrait of a child than the child I wound up um, following. And I think the reason that that happened was that in all of my early research, I was so focused on meeting a certain kind of criteria, which is often what we do as reporters going in. We, we think, what is the most representative story, if there could be such a thing, the, the, the closest approximation to today's poor child, uh, how do I capture that um, in a way that feels like a new story and at the same time representative of, of so much of what's going on, which is that there were fewer people getting married, uh, that there were a lot of people hovering on the poverty line, sometimes above poverty, sometimes dipping below, but kind of basically making it work sometimes um, by piecing together multiple jobs with no benefits, for example, falling in and out of housing. Um, families were smaller. Uh, so there was all this kind of like data, right? And so I, I think that amounted in my mind to 
Latino kid, I'm Latina, it would have been easier in some ways, you know, to, I speak Spanish, I could speak, um, my mother's from, from South America, I could, I, so I tried to find that kid who was maybe Latino, but also of, uh, of different um, backgrounds of maybe an African-American father, Latina mother, you know, you just go in thinking this is, this is the, this is the portrait. And what you find is that the checklist, and I keep finding this always in my, in my work, it's like a, an experience that's on repeat, that I go in thinking I know what the story is only to be shown something radically different. Um, but yeah, so, so like a mom uh, with maybe two kids from two, two different fathers who's newly homeless. Anyway, I interviewed a lot of people. Um, it's hard to find a child who wants to share um, and the first thing that jumped out at me about Dasani, who I met as she was walking outside a shelter in Brooklyn with her seven siblings and her mother, was how much she wanted to talk. And also just the things she said were so delightful. She was a creative thinker and funny and um, charismatic and interesting, you know, to be around. Um, but she was sort of like if there was a diametrical opposite of that checklist, it was her. I mean, number one, her parents were married, which is increasingly rare. They were chronically homeless, chronically poor, large family. Um, and so it was, it was kind of going against the grain of what I was told I should look for to represent the new face of poverty. And yet in my gut, I felt there's really an important story here. There's, listen, Andrea, pay attention to your gut, which is kind of all I can do as a reporter a lot of the time. Uh, there's so much to unpack about Dasani and then some of the larger themes in the story and her family, but you mentioned her family was chronically homeless. What do you mean by that? So Dasani had been in shelters more than she had been uh, in rentals by the time I met her. She was 11 years old and she'd lived in multiple shelters, maybe eight by then. Uh, and, and in New York City, you have a legal right to shelter if you can prove you have nowhere to go. And so the shelter system is large and it's there and the family knew it was there, would struggle to get into rentals and find themselves unable to keep up with the rent and wind up back in the homeless system. Mm -hmm. So she was a kid who had not just been chronically homeless, she'd been serially displaced. And I think that's also a thing about homelessness that people don't quite comprehend is the impact of what one ethnographer describes uh, Mindy Foley Love as root shock, the impact of serial displacement on children, which is similar to what happens to plants if they are uprooted from their soil and try you try to replant them and it's hard for them to survive. Now children are much more resilient than plants, but uh, when you're constantly having to readjust to a new subway station, to a new bodega, to a new school, to a new setup in your room, where, where everything is just is changing under your feet, it becomes a very different kind of life than, than the childhood I had, for sure. Yeah. When you um, come into the family um, and meet the family, at that time, they're living at the Auburn Family Shelter. And we should point out that this is a family of, as you mentioned, um, husband and wife, uh, the husband supreme, the uh, wife, the mother, Chanel, um, Dasani and seven siblings, um, all living in one room. What were the circumstances like um, at Auburn and, and what marked, you talked about being uprooted, what were the the elements of Dasani's life at that moment when you first uh, encountered her? They had just experienced what was, not just, a few years earlier, they had come out of what was, I think, the high point of their lives as a family, which is that they had gotten a voucher to move to a rental in Staten Island, and they, were, they had left um, the city, so to speak, for the most suburban borough of the five boroughs in, in New York City, which can often be mis mistook for a, for a suburb because it, it, it does feel like that. I mean, there's lawns and it's quiet. And that was what Dasani noticed immediately. And she had this home for the first time 
in her memory as a child that was stable and it lasted for a few years and then the family lost that home and part of it was that bed bug bugs overtook the home it was also that a voucher program that the city had supported um, a, a rental subsidy program i should say had run out and wasn't replaced and these these things just kind of coalesced into a disaster for the family. They wound up back on the ferry and then back in the Bronx going to seek shelter in the intake office and then were assigned of all the hundreds of shelters that they could have been assigned to, to the Auburn family residence, which is in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And I don't know if you would like to look at photos. Yeah, um, I was just gonna, it's actually kind moment, of a perfect right? opportunity. Maybe one, if you don't mind, we could bring up some photos that, um, Andrea, if, if you wouldn't mind just narrating and introducing us to the various family sure. members and their life experience, it might help all of us just see into the world more clearly. Um, so that's Dasani in the foreground. And in the background is her closest of the seven siblings, Aviana, who was also named after a brand of bottled water like Dasani was, the Evian bottle. Uh, she was born 11 months later, and they were both named aspirationally after um, something that symbolized to their mom, Chanel, who herself was named after the perfume, symbolized a better life, a luxury that they couldn't afford. And this is a photo that was taken the year that I met them. And uh, I, I just think it says so much about Dasani's presence as a person. Yeah, let's go to the next photo. This is Dasani celebrating her 13th birthday. That is her mother, Chanel, on the right. And there is the whole family with Supreme, her husband, who is a barber, standing next to her and the baby in the stroller um, and all of her other siblings. Um, she, Dasani, there she is with Lily, the baby, really considered herself a third parent. These photographs, I should mention, were taken by the wonderful photographer Ruth Fremson with the New York Times who embedded with me that first year to, to capture some really intimate moments. So Dasani really was a kind of parentified child as sociologists and others would consider her. Um, she didn't think of it that way. She called it more like, um, I'm, I'm, she basically referred to herself sometimes as mommy. <laughs> and um, she took on that role in part because she was the oldest of the kids and of the of the of the daughters, I should say, second oldest of all of them, and just very talented and gifted and quick and nimble. And those are the very things that made it possible for her to reach for something better for a different life, but also kept her, I think, mired in the problems that her parents couldn't really solve by themselves because they were overwhelmed. And that was one of the great conflicts and sources of tension that I witnessed for many years was between what are her obligations to her family and what is the promise that she wants to meet for herself. Um, we'll come back so, to that theme, but um, go ahead. Yeah, and this is her in school. She was on the honor roll when I met her, which is extraordinary given um, the way that she was living at home. And I think we have some of those photographs with us. I hope we do. Uh, that's her. So part of her morning routine involved taking her kids, her kids, as she would say, her younger siblings to school, walking them. She did so much work every morning. And it was like, by the time other kids were just waking up to go to school, this kid had been working for two hours to help, you know, just keep the family running. Um, and yet she was on the honor roll, which was kind of extraordinary. Let's see what the next photo is. It might, that's her on the train with her mother and uh, her siblings. Um, they spent, we spent a lot of time standing like there, right there was one night, very, very cold night. She's wearing a jacket that was um, donated to her by a security guard at the school. Um, we spent so much time just on the street and um, on the train and just walking because uh, that is where a lot of her childhood was unfolding, was, was in the city itself, outside, not inside. I, do we have any other photos or are those all the photos I gave you guys? I think we may have a couple more. This is, I thought I had a photo of the room. Well, this is her in her, in her, but I'll just describe the room for you anyway. This is her in her dance studio, which was the closest that she'd ever gotten to her dream, which was to be a dancer. Um, also, another dream was to be a sprinter and go to the Olympics. She was very athletic. Um, 
but you know, the school was just a refuge like libraries are for kids like her and the local library, the Whitman um, library was for her. These are safe spaces. It's the only place where she could find a dance studio. School was the only place where she had a closet in her homeroom, which is such a powerful word when you think about it. For a kid who's homeless, who's living in a shelter where there is no closet, she comes to school every day and can tuck her coat into the closet. So that was that was a lot of the kind of tension that I was witnessing was between what she could have and she saw was there in the outside world and what was her burden to carry in her inside world, which was this room that was very crowded, uh, overrun with mice and mold and roaches. It was a very disturbing and upsetting thing to see a, a family living in, um, given that's her at school going and grabbing a snack in the morning because she'd missed free breakfast. Uh, there was a free breakfast at the shelter and there's a free breakfast at school, but often she was so overwhelmed she missed both. And her favorite thing in the world was and continues to be to this day Oreos. <laughs> um, but yeah, in that room, it was a, a room that was in a shelter that was run by a city agency with a $1 billion annual budget. And yet it was just a scene of Dickensian level poverty. And um, she was making the best of it when I met her. She would wake up in the morning and go to the window and look at the Empire State Building and say that it made her feel like something else is going on out there which is a scene that, um, that happens early on in the book that tries to, I, I tried and with that scene to kind of set the stage for who this kid is and why we're gonna follow her for the next eight years. Yeah. Um, we don't have a photo of that room, but you did uh, a terrific job. I'm gonna try to, I'll try to find one and maybe share the screen, but I, I will do it um, carefully. <laughs> Because I feel like I should show you, but anyway, I'm sorry because I thought I had included it. It's no, it's, it's no problem at all. Um, I was going to say that um, you know one of the things that um, you do such a beautiful job of in this book is um, telling these moments of interiority, literally and and um, and figuratively, and these moments of intimacy, um, individuals and families taking us inside um, their home, their shelter room, their lives. Their, um, I wanna talk more about your reporting process, but how did you gain access to um, both, both the family's trust, but also to a world of such intimacy that you could describe um, the challenges and the realities and the hopes and dreams with with such detail. So the way that Chanel likes to tell the story, which is so funny because uh, our memories match, but these are different vantage points of the exact same set of events is so her coming out of the shelter every day, knowing that I was waiting to try to talk to her and sending her kids out first to take a look <laughs> and saying, is the white lady still there? Goes to tell me, and then they come back and be like, ma, she's still there, but she's fine, come on. <laughs> and she would just, I think I just like, I think I just wear people down. I think, I, I, I don't know, I'm very stubborn and I don't have any problem spending just incredibly outrageous amounts of time waiting to the point where I, 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 I wear out my editor's patience every last bit of it. But I think that's the way, I think you can talk your best game as a journalist and it, it doesn't come close to just the experience that lives outside of uh, verbal language that is about being together and just showing up, showing your face, laughing together, uh, being bored together, walking together. But anyway, but my experience was I'm outside the shelter. I'm trying to get in. It's closed to the public. It's definitely gonna be closed to reporters or if they know that I'm on the story, they're gonna make the problem go away. And so I'm sort of trying to, to stay quiet or undercover, so to speak, while being clear with the moms, with the homeless families that I'm talking to who I am, but trying to, to do it in a quiet way. And everyone keeps saying, you, 
you know, there's this family of 10 in this one room. And that's the one you got to talk to, Chanel. And uh, I could just tell she was a bit of a, really in their eyes, a kind of leader, right? More than a bit. And she was somebody who was unafraid, that she was willing to speak in ways that others weren't. I, from the things they were saying, I could tell that. And then I saw her one day coming out. This is before I began hanging out, waiting, waiting, waiting. And I was the white lady who was waiting. This was the first moment. And it was something about their presence as a family and their unity and the way they walked in single file, which I would later learn was the way that they felt was uh, how you project confidence on the street and how you are um, really a force to be reckoned with as a family, that no one's gonna mess with you because you're walking together uni unified, your children are obeying you. It's a, it was a sort of sense of just tremendous discipline. Like, I, I wanna know what they're all about. <laughs> like, what's this family deal? What's their story? Um, I gave her my card and I uh, just tried over a series of, of weeks really to, we met in the park and we did an initial interview, but I think she was understandably trepidatious and I think one thing that bonded us early is that we had a shared adversary in a sense, which was poverty and more specifically the way that poverty was being tolerated unfolding in this shelter that I couldn't get access to. And so she became my accomplice in a sense, my, my partner in storytelling. I gave the New York Times, we supplied them with cameras and, um, a temperature monitor because the temp, you know, would dip into really cold uh, or get really hot in the room because there was no climate control. It was just, we, we wanted their help in documenting how horrible this place was. And so that bonded us. I think another thing that helped was I'm a mom and I had um, two very young children at that point. And Chanel later said to me, you know, if you weren't a mother, I would never let you my children. And I understood that. And I think she also just liked seeing uh, how the other aspects of myself kind of peaked out, even though I didn't intend them to, for example, taking a phone call from my mother and then proceeding to, as we are, we always do, bicker in Spanish in front of her on the phone. And she just thought it was hilarious. She's like, you are a real human being. Like you, I, anyone who has a mom knows that it's complicated. <laughs> I love my mom, but you know, and she just, she, she was seeing me in many dimensions as I was trying to see her. And I think that that, that set the stage early, early on in our relationship for the way it was gonna feel constantly for both of us was this exploration of like, who are you? And what are you, what are you here to show me? How do you see Chanel as a person, as a mother in this story? I see her as a survivor more than anything of forces beyond her control. And also someone who understandably to my mind succumbed to temptations that she later regretted, including joining a violent sect of the Bloods gang. Um, these are all things that I wrote about in depth in the book. Uh, early on becoming addicted to, to drugs and struggling all her life with that addiction, um, which is something that is so easily judged, especially when it comes to parents. How could you do that? You have kids, you know, mostly in my experience, Chanel was trying not to do it. She was trying to work her program and stay sober. And this was something I was intimately familiar with because my brother, my older brother had struggled all his life with addiction. And so I think it took a little while for me to, to go there with Chanel, but I did because I understood. I understood what I was seeing and was struggling with it in my own life in a really major way with, with Thomas, with my brother who, who actually passed away in December. And so, yeah, it was, I think her, seeing that these things can cross the boundaries of race and class and uh, that these are human struggles. And I uh, sort of embodied that to her in a way, even though my life was in almost every measurable way 
she would say better than hers, luckier than hers. This is where we totally agreed. It's so much about luck, where the luck of birth, where you wind up getting born, what, what kinds of privileges you wind up with or don't. And yet there are these things that universally bind us. And I found that always, you know, in my work is trying to figure out what those spaces are and how to name them and how to stay in them with the people I'm writing about as much as possible, because that's what makes it possible for me to, to reach for the, I loved your word, um, interiority. <laughs> um, that is, that is, I think probably my greatest goal, uh, as, as, as a, as a reporter is to get inside yeah. and, and really be able to responsibly and deeply convey that interior, even if it's not my own. Yeah, I, I want to um, follow up on a couple of things, but let me just remind everybody who's with us that the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen uh, is the best place to put your questions. And we do want to encourage you to keep the questions coming. We'll turn to those in just a few minutes um, and are eager to, to hear your thoughts and reflections and questions for Andrea. Um, there's, there's so much richness here to get to. And I think this idea of judging um, really is a powerful takeaway. I think about all the ways in which society, uh, broadly speaking, or we as individuals pass judgment about uh, everything from uh, addiction and substance abuse to um, the size of a family um, to decisions that we make about how we spend our money to um, or, or choices we make about education or life or which doors to walk through, which doors not to walk through, um, down to actually what it means to be a good parent. And uh, that's a through line throughout this entire book. Um, and I don't want to overlook Dasani in here because she's just such a, a, a profound um, person at the heart of uh, the reporting and story that you tell. But I, I want to stay with this because Dasani, I should just to fill in gaps for those who haven't read um, Invisible Child, uh, has an extraordinary opportunity um, to go to a private boarding school in Pennsylvania, the Hershey School, um, by virtue of uh, her talents and by virtue of the circumstances in which she finds herself um, and her family, um, and would be delighted for you to say a word or two about that. And at the same time, her family is, uh, over the time that I think you were with them, uh, was continually under the watchful eye or surveilling eye or protective eye, however you want to characterize it, of child protective services. Some 12 visits during a period of time checking, you know, checking and reporting on, um, raising questions about uh, the, 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 frankly, the health of the children and the healthy environment they were growing up in. And these two things are sort of happening simultaneously during a key moment of Dasani's life. So uh, I, I, there are many questions to ask. Maybe you could spend just a minute talking about both the child protective services system as you encountered it, and then ultimately the impact that that had on the family and on Dasani's journey. Yes. So ACS, which is the biggest of many acronyms that define Dasani's childhood. These are city agencies, uh, HRA, welfare, DHS, homeless services, ACS, Administration for Children's Services. That was the biggest one, the most powerful, the one that had the power to potentially break up Dasani's family. That is how she felt their presence. That's the worry she carried for years to the point where she once, when actually the year I met her, uh, when we were uh, when she was at the Auburn shelter, she went to the rec room and Googled that ACS asks you because she was trying to research how best to be prepared if the caseworkers come again. When I came into the story as just a total outsider to that world, I think I brought a lot of the perceptions that many people bring. Well, if you're being monitored, for for good reason, um, if a kid gets separated, removed from a family and put into foster care, that means that home was a disaster and foster care is really the best place. Um, these are abused kids. 
these are probably parents who shouldn't have had kids. You know, you just have these ideas because it's so extreme to separate a child from a parent. And if you have any question about how that plays out in the American um, public square, just think back to 2016 and the border and Trump and migrants being separated from their children and the uproar that, that happened you know, across America over this. How could we in this country do this to children? And yet, if you spend any time in predominantly non-white um, neighborhoods, and it also affects white poor communities, but, but predominantly poor and predominantly black and brown, neighborhoods, what you see is like, look, this is this kind of separation has been happening for decades. And the vast majority of these cases, 75% of them are neglect cases, they're not abuse. And neglect is a very, very different animal, so to speak. We know what abuse is, abuse is intention to harm, we don't want kids to be in, 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 in any under any threat of abuse, obviously. But in cases of neglect, what you're looking at more often is failure to provide, it's inaction. It's so closely correlated to poverty. It's, it's failure to provide adequate housing, failure to provide adequate clothes or adequate cl uh, food. In the case of this family, the children, but all of, most of their, uh, all of their uh, um, cases that involved and never, there was only one time where they separated the mom were neglect uh, accusations. So these were, this was, you know, you guys just don't have it together as parents. And for the problems of poverty and also addiction, which is, I would argue, very closely correlated to the traumas that went untreated in their pasts. Instead of getting the help they needed and the supports they needed, uh, they they wound they found themselves in this very punitive system. And Dasani experienced it as a kid as a very, very threatening um, force because her own system of survival was the system of her siblings, that they the, the, the kind of bond that they created was how they they shielded themselves from the like gale force winds of this other world that they were, the outside world. This was how they stayed safe. Was One of the reasons why Chanel wanted to have a large family yes. and large measure. Yeah, yes, exactly. And that's what's so interesting about judgments, right? We have these judgments. She had a lot of kids because she was irresponsible. And when you start to unpack them, you're, oh, I, I find myself constantly surprised and fascinated by what winds up being the explanation? It it was this was a planned family. This was a family um, that was in was created by design, and it was all about trying to provide for her for the next generation for Chanel and Supreme's offspring what they lacked as kids, what they lacked, which was uh, th they came from families that were broken up, and they didn't. As Chanel put it to me once, I didn't want my children to um, wind up bonding with people on the street who called them brother and sister, but who weren't their brothers and sisters, because that's how the street became my family. And I didn't want the street to become their family too. So this was this was the most important thing for them was them, that just their the human fact of them, right? That their existence as a group, as a collective, nobody thought of, of him or herself in that family as an individual, really. Uh, everything was in tandem. And so the idea, like you could imagine to Dasani of them being split up was horrifying. She'd much rather be in a room packed with nine family members than have everyone split up in foster care. And that is precisely what happened. And you are right to connect it to Hershey. I think she sees the two as causal, actually. The fact that she left to go to this boarding school in Pennsylvania then created an absence of, 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 the, of the order that the family was used to, right? That she was, she was a very strong cog in the wheel and she suddenly removed herself and things fell apart. As a result, you know, her brother, little brother ran away five days later after she went to Hershey, that set off a new investigation, which snowballed um, into a bunch of things. But that really, I, I would say, and this is very closely unpacked in the book and examined is a tragic story of a, a parents overwhelmed by the problems of poverty who for through no fault of their own actually wound up being blamed for the conditions of their section eight rental and then 
lost their kids in, to a foster care system that created tremendous harm. We're going to go to questions um, here in just a second. Um, so, uh, Christy, we'll bring you in here in just a moment. Um, Andre, I don't know if you have a copy of the book um, at hand, but there's there's a passage actually um, on page 492 and a 493 yeah. that um, sort of picks up on this story. So the, the family is really splintered, um, different kids to different foster families, in some cases, multiple families. And among them, and, and one of the things that you say in the book, if I have this right, is that this is not just sort of an event, that is to say, children removed from the parents, that it's actually, it's, it's, it's a long standing state of being that just that, that permeates and filters and shapes and weighs on every individual um, uh, for a long, long time. Uh, over a period of, of, of many months. And one of the relationships uh, that was, was strained as a result of these circumstances was Dasani's relationship with her, her close sister, Aviana. So I'm wondering if you might read the passage um, and maybe set it up um, before we go. Yes, to yes. I love this passage. Um, it, in part because uh, it really got inside of me. Uh, what what happened this day? Um, I was there the day that the children were removed, and I witnessed the removal of Lily, which is described in the prologue, and the fallout, and um, of all the relationships, the one that I was certain would not fray was the one between Dasani and Aviana, who considered themselves twins. They were born eleven months apart, and they could literally finish each other's thoughts. And they shared the same mattress, the same pillow. Uh, when they, when I first met them, when they were eleven and ten, same mattress, same pillow, same dresser, um, different drawers in the same dresser, and uh, they could, they claimed to read each other's thoughts. I mean, this is how close they were. They had this sort of tele telepathy, and it was real because I, they would suddenly burst into laughter in front of me when nothing had been said, and maybe three minutes had passed, and then they laughed, and it was like the joke was thought between them, but <laughs> it was just an extraordinarily close relationship. Um, and after being split up, sure enough, they went a year without talking, which was just unthinkable to me that they were in different foster homes and they were estranged. And Dasani was starting to show signs that she was falling in like her mother had with um, a sect of the bloods. Anyway, so this is where this passage begins. Forever Family writes Dasani on December 3rd, 2017, above a photograph on Facebook showing three new friends. They are throwing gang signs. Dasani, now 16, knows that her strange sister Aviana will be rankled by this. To write Forever Family is Dasani's way of saying the opposite, that nothing is forever, not even family that one's sister can be replaced as easily as one's own blood, which is not thicker than water, as their mother used to say. In the photograph, Dasani wears a red bandana in allegiance to the bloods. One family is poised to take the place of another. Dasani has not seen Aviana in over a year. They last exchanged texts five months ago, but Dasani knows how to break her sister's silence. Precisely two hours and 35 minutes after Dasani posts the Forever Family photo, Aviana appears on Facebook, clicking a digital hand. The hand waves at her sister. Dasani waves back. Hey, sis, writes 15-year-old Aviana. A feverish correspondence follows. They agree to meet the following weekend at a subway station in Queens. They are both nervous, so Aviana sends detailed instructions. Dasani must take the A train to Broadway Junction, then the J train to Queens, to the last stop, get off, go upstairs, and then meet me at the turnstile. Queens is not Dasani's turf. She asks for the name of the station, which worries Aviana. Nothing can be left to chance. Instead, they settle on Broadway Junction, which is impossible to miss. Got you, sis, Aviana writes. On the afternoon of December 10, Aviana leaves her foster home in Queens 
and Dasani leaves her foster home in Staten Island. They check their phones. I'm on the train, writes Aviana. Me too, writes Dasani. By 1.28 p.m., they are minutes apart. Both trains arrive and the sisters dis dismount. They cannot find each other. Aviana writes that she is here. Dasani writes that she's coming upstairs. Aviana writes that she's coming down. No, Dasani writes, she's coming up. Where are you at, Dasani asks. Aviana is at the turnstile. Come to the escalators, writes Dasani. The thread stops. The station stops. Two sisters are crashing into each other. They have words. They hold each other like refugees who have crossed an unseen border. Everyone is watching. Mind your own damn business, Dasani manages to shout from her sister's impossible clutch. She cannot breathe like this. No one hugs like this. You're holding me too tight. Let me go, let me go. No one lets go. They stand like this for minutes. They already know their next move. The A train will come, taking them to downtown Brooklyn where their mother is waiting. The train is coming train that their grandmother used to clean. It pulls into the station. The doors open. That's a beautiful, beautiful passage among so many really powerful passages in this book. Thank you for, for reading that, Andrea. Thanks for sharing that. Um, there's so much more to say. I Let me just pause so we can bring in others into the conversation. Um, Christy Palangatil of the Naperville Public Library, um, we turn to you for questions. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Andrea. Um, this was wonderful. Uh, everyone, there will be a short uh, poll that's gonna show up on your screen for just a really short time. If you have more than one person watching, um, at your location, just please fill out that poll. Thank you. All right, uh, the first question we have, Andrea, is actually, um, Gail says, thank you for this interview. I couldn't put down this book. I have two questions. First, this book is part of a genre. I work in the social service system and I wonder how do we change this long time narrative? Second, how does your privilege affect how you were able to tell Dasani's story? Those are such great questions. Um, if only I had the answer <laughs> to how to change things, I would not ever assume uh, that I can, I can offer that expertise. I think my role is to show what I, what I, what I experienced and hopefully it's sort of deep enough portrait that it gets policymakers thinking in new ways. I mean, I have some observations from my time in these systems that I would love to offer just as observations. And one observation is that in the life of this family and other families around them, I also observed, it made a huge difference when there was income. And after the book was done, we saw for a period of time, a child tax credit. Um, and that was part of pandemic relief and it lifted more than 3 million children out of poverty every month. And there've been studies done on how families spent that money. And I think there is this assumption that poor parents are gonna blow the funds on the wrong things. I never saw that with this family. I always saw that the first thing they wanted to do because of course they are way more like the rest of us than people realize as parents is they wanted to feed their kids and they wanted to make, give them proper clothing. And they, so um, the fact that there isn't this sort of guaranteed basic kind of income as part of this country's project is striking to uh, many countries in Europe. I was just in the UK on book tour and uh, they find the, 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 the state of the safety net in the United States just kind of shocking. Also just the lack of a universal housing voucher. There's less than 4% of Americans have access to federal uh, housing programs. And that's astonishing given how expensive housing is. So those are some things. And the other major thing I would say that I took away from this is just the importance of seeing parents as part of a solution rather than the problem. That sounds so obvious, but it doesn't actually carry out in policy. We don't see parents and the family unit as being as treated being treated as an asset. 
it's more treated as something to get around, a detriment, something to remove Dasani from as she is, quote unquote escapes poverty, rather than looking at the, the conditions she's forced to escape as something that uh, should be the center of our attention. How do we fix the communities? Um, privilege is just another huge and giant question. It's something I grapple with mightily in the book. It's in the afterward. I mean, I am utterly transformed by my years with this family. And um, I think that the way it shaped the writing, because I think that was specifically the question is um, a really interesting question, because I think that so much of this book is not a book about one community. It's about the encounter between these two vastly different communities that have found themselves increasingly in coexistence because of things like gentrification. The hollowing out of the middle class, you see rich and poor more extremely kind of side by side in New York City than ever was the case um, uh, going back a century. <laughs> and so it's a, a story of this encounter between these two different worlds. And that is also the story of my relationship with this family. So I think that those things wound up, I think the fact that that's part of the story and the fact that that was the tenor of our relationship was all of a piece, if that makes sense, and helped to shape the narrative in a sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Hillary says, I loved your book and have recommended it to everyone I know, including my book club. Thank At you. the end, you say something about the story through the eyes of a child as opposed to an adult. This is immediately after disclosing that the oldest brother has been accused of shooting someone in a carjacking. There was so much in the story about institutional and societal and historical racism and the odds being stacked against this family. I'm so curious about how you find personal responsibility to fit into the narrative. Like at what point do these wrong decisions become the fault of the family members? I really, there's so many different ways to answer that question, but I will just focus because we're, we're running out of time. I'm gonna to try to do this in one minute. We're talking about Kalik, who I think was the most, uh, suffered the most, the consequences of the breakup of the family. And I saw it firsthand. I saw this was a kid who kept the family. He was a sort of another version of Dasani. He was always cleaning. He's always, he was responsible. He was always home at night. He had his father which like met most of his male friends did not. He had his dad, he had a married couple as his role models. And yes, they struggled, they messed up, but he was grounded by that. And he then found himself in a foster care system that left him hungry, frankly, on the street and um, totally abandoned and, in, and, and actually barred legally from seeing his parents unless it was supervised. So he'd show up at their door and they'd say, here's $5 to go get something to eat, but you've got to go away. This is all in the book, but I saw his transformation. And I, I, I do think, yes, personal responsibility is something that this family talks about and is, is, is certainly has a role in, in, in every, every human life, but you cannot look at what happened to him absent the, events that shaped him at such a pivotal and, and, and crucial age that sent him into the street and made it part of his survival to be in this gang. And I, I, I don't know the particulars, you know, he is now facing a murder charge. So I can't really talk about the case because I, I'm not able, I talk to him once a week, he's at Rikers right now, but it's a recorded line. So we don't talk about the case, um, but it's just all very sad. And I think, uh, Yes, I think he would have had a, I do believe he would have had a different life and a different outcome had he been able to stay with his parents rather than being put in a system that found, wound up spending $33,000 on average a month on these kids, rather than staying at home with his parents and they could have spent a fraction of that, that amount of money keeping the family together. So the funding is also just really striking to me. I think in this country, we pay for poverty on the back end. We don't pay for it on the front end. The expensive programs that would keep a family together, that would be preventive, prevention focused, um, don't have political backing. But we wind up spending money on incarceration, on huge uh, costly health problems, on the fact that um, people are, have less earning power because they drop out of high school because they have all of these 
adult outcomes that are closely correlated to trauma and to the experience that these kids have been through are, are expensive. It's just never seen as the price that we pay on the front end. It's always just talked about as an after effect. So there's just so much to say about this. I know, because and I'm trying to, I'm trying not to go off on too many tangents, <laughs> but yes, I, I don't think it was his responsibility entirely what happened. Uh, Nancy says, please tell us about the father. Was he always present? Did he work? Did he have addiction problems too? I mean, Supreme is one of the most complex and interesting people I've ever written about. Um, I write about him at length in the book. He is full of surprises. He was utterly devoted as a dad. Yes, he struggled with addiction. His parents were on heroin and he, at age seven, had to learn to cut his um, sibling's hair. And that's how he became a barber. And so he's had a lot of trauma um, from an early stage and, and untreated traumas, but he really loved his kids. And I think uh, really took pride in his parenting. And I have always saw them as a family that ran an orderly home. Things were clean. Uh, he was a fabulous cook. He loved to watch cooking shows. I mean, he took so much pride and care and he was more the nurturer of the two, actually. Chanel was more of the breadwinner. She was out in the street trying to, you know, hustle for money, whereas he was at home kind of trying to, to keep the, the flock together. So he's, he's a really um, notable and memorable uh, person in the book. So I know- And, and utterly complex, I will say, yeah. and also flawed like most people. <laughs> Why don't we take one last one, Christy, maybe? And then yeah. we can yeah. So um, Hillary, well, okay. Uh, Christopher says, why do you think the United States is to so tolerant of child poverty in contrast to the rhetoric of how much, um, I think the rhetoric of how we supposedly value children? Um, I mean, that's, a, that is with, like the, that's yeah. the ultimate question, isn't it? It's so confusing. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I've answered some of that already and I don't want to, but um, we have three minutes left, but I, I, I would just say, yes, this is a country that prides itself on um, everyone having a shot on meritocracy. But when you see how hard it is for a kid like Dasani to actually succeed, the barriers are so uh, close to impossible in, in, in a, an environment that she's in, like the one she's in, and where so much of the burden is carried by public institutions that are underfunded, like, like the school system. Um, and also, by the way, libraries. I mean, the Whitman Library was this local little library that honestly doubled as a child care center, but in a de facto way, I mean, the librarians were heroes in this place. These kids would come in every day after school. This was their safe space. This is where they could get a snack and try to work on homework and find calm and quiet and not be in a crowded space like home was. And, you know, the idea that we just don't shore up our kids the way that other countries do. I mean, this the United States has the worst child poverty rate of any developed nation. It is the richest large country in the world. And in New York City, which is the richest city in the richest large country in the world, we have nearly half of all people hovering or below the poverty line. So why, I don't know, uh, except that uh, it seems to be a very unpopular thing in this country to create the kind of funds and programs that would make a difference. Um, I want to just interject quickly as we wrap um, to have you say a quick word or two about Dasani and her family today. And you were kind enough to share a photograph uh, yeah. of Dasani and her mom and Aviana today. So maybe we could bring that up and you could share an update with us. So this is a photograph that was taken last year actually in my apartment. Um, I had an author photo taken, so I decided that they should have one too. <laughs> and I love it so much. It's, it's so evocative of everything that I, um, I cherish about them as people. They, after a long court battle, um, were reunited and Chanel has custody of, of them as well as Papa. And they're living in a rental in the Bronx. 
And Dasani was the first in her family to graduate from high school and the first in, in her immediate family to enroll in community college. And so she's really trying to succeed on her own terms. She wants to stay at home and stay in her community and also uh, transcend the uh, problems that kept her mother's life from greater success. And so she's trying to do it differently. And I think um, it's, uh, there's a lot to learn in, in watching her path and in her story. The, the book is called, of course, Invisible Child, Poverty, Survival, and Hope in an American City. It's the work of Andrea Elliott, who's an investigative reporter for the New York Times. Andrea, uh, as we hand things back to Beth Carroll, I just want to thank you so much for this conversation, um, for your reporting, and for yeah. helping us see into this family much more deeply. May I say one more thing? A portion of the proceeds of this book will be shared with the family, and information is on my website. Uh, about the trust that was created for the for the siblings and their college education, Invisible Child Family Trust. And it's on my website. Thank you. But thank you so much. And this was wonderful. Thank you both, Andrea and Steve, for tonight's thoughtful conversation. And Andrea, for the beautiful reading. And to both you and Steve, thanks for spending time with us this evening. And thank you all who joined us. Tonight's event was presented by 21 Library across the state of Illinois. Uh, the, we have links to the two bookstores that are supporting this event in the chat, the Bookstyle and Prairie Fox books. And um, links, you can find the link to purchase the book or check it out from the library. And a portion, as Andrea mentioned, of the proceeds will go to helping Desani's family and others like them. And we have a link to Andrea's website in the chat as well, where you can find more information about that. So um, tonight's event was recorded. You'll be able to access the recording on your library's website or on your library's YouTube channel in the next few days. As we say good night and log off, you'll see a short survey on the screen uh, following the event. And again, uh, thank you very much to everyone for joining us tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night.